Hello, this is Tuesday, July the 28th, and we continue our mini Bible series as we look at the readings that are coming up for this Sunday, August the 2nd, the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. Today, I will be reading for you and reflecting on the psalm for the day, which is Psalm number 145, uh, verses 8 and 9, and then jumping to 14 through 21. So let me read that for you. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, you are good to all, and your compassion is over all your works. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open wide your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. You are righteous in all your ways and loving in all your works. You are near to all who call upon you, to all who call upon you faithfully. You fulfill the desire of those who fear you. You hear the cry and save them. You watch over all those who love you, but all the wicked you shall destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all the flesh bless God's holy name forever and ever. And I feel like we should add an amen to that. Uh, it's not in the text, but it just seems natural when you say, forever and ever, amen. Uh, Thomas Merton. If you don't know him, you may want to look him up. Uh, I don't have time to do all a good uh, history of Thomas Merton, but a theologian, um, a priest, uh, came out of a lifestyle that was less than desirable into a lifestyle that was um, in seclusion and in prayer to God. And Thomas Merton once wrote, Praise is cheap. Wow. How does that work? And he says that prayer is primarily about creating a space in which to praise God and to meditate and to fix our thoughts on God. This is how prayer becomes a two-way conversation between us and God. We give homage to so many things that Merton says our praise becomes cheapened in that way. And maybe, maybe this will help. He continues by writing, Do we know what it means to praise, to adore, to give glory? Praise is cheap today. Everything is praised. Soap, beer, toothpaste, clothing, mouthwash, movie stars, all the latest gadgets which are supposed to make our life more comfortable. Everything is constantly being praised. Praise is now so overdone that everybody is sick of it. And since everything is praised with the hollow enthusiasm of the radio announcer, it turns out in the end that nothing is praised. Praise has become empty. Nobody really wants to use it. Wow. I guess in our consumerism society that may be more true than we sometimes think about. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian, pastor, uh, during the time of the Nazi uh, German Third Reich, um, he writes about cheap grace. Uh, so is it also accurate to say that our praises of God has is cheap? Or maybe that it at least has become cheapened. Perhaps. Do people sometimes praise God with so much talking that the words become hollow? Or do people sometimes praise God as if God were a heavenly Santa Claus who gives us all the gifts we want? Or do people sometimes treat God as some kind of street vendor with whom we can bargain. Okay, God, I'll give you praise if you will do fill in the blank for yourself. 
Praise is cheap if and when we cheapen our praise to God. How then do we begin to claim Psalm 145 as our own when it commits us to voice our praise to God? Psalm 145 is considered to be the final psalm from a section dedicated to or written by King David. While Psalm 145 belongs to David and expresses David's personal commitment to worship God, the psalm is not primarily about one person's individual praise. It has a universal scope, a universal reach that calls the whole of creation to praise God's name forever and ever. Amen, right? The verse this week's um, emphasis is about the goodness of Yahweh, the Lord. Again, when you see Lord in all caps, it's talking about Yahweh, God's personal name. And this is this is goodness of Yahweh is the benchmark for our praise. Like Psalm 103 and, and others, Psalm 145 verse 8 borrows language from Yahweh's self-revelation to the people in the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verse 6, where Yahweh is describing himself as gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and full of steadfast love. And repeated use of Yahweh, again, when you see the word Lord in all capital letters, Yahweh, here in verses 8 and 9 especially, all of these attributes point to the Lord, Yahweh, the guardian of all creation. Verse 9 emphasizes Yahweh's goodness and compassion to all people. Here, the word all seems to be uniquely inclusive. Rather than expressing a defined nation, like all of Israel, this section indicates that the psalm refers to all of humanity and all of creation. There's no room in this language to exclude anything or anyone that God has created. Moreover, verse nine, or yeah, verses nine here in this section echoes verse one of the psalm, and it captures Yahweh as the king over all that he has made. Not one king among many kings or different kings, the king. Another theologian and an author by the name of Walter Brueggemann suggests that from there on the rest of Psalm 145 is best understood as an extrapolation from these verses to see how God's characteristic self-giving is experienced in the daily blessings of creation. In other words, you go out into creation and you see God's goodness. You see God's compassion. And all of our interactions with creation, whether uh, created things or created people, from this point on, Brueggemann says, everything God has created, we treat as if it is God's goodness and with compassion. Verse 14, we are given a picture of a proactive God who upholds the falling and raises those who have been bowed down. Now, it's perfectly logical to wonder why a God who keeps people from falling would allow some to be bowed down. Yet, this term may be synonymous with being knocked over by someone or something. I know at our age, being knocked over is a very scary thing because it could be tantamount to a broken bone or broken hip and lay us up for many, many weeks. In such an example, it is Yahweh, the Lord, who will provide rescue for all people. 
Therefore, as it says in verse 15, all the eyes look to Yahweh, who provides in due time. The final verse, verse 21, expresses a commitment of the psalmist and of the universe, really, to continue to praise God. More importantly, it suggests that this praise will have everlasting, permanent quality. Verse 1, or this Psalm 145, is a robust hymn of praise and proclamation, really. The individual, the community, the whole of creation is to praise God for God's goodness and God's greatness. We also are to participate in this praise, genuinely and full-bodied, with our full attention, without allowing numerous words piled upon each other to cheapen the experience. We are to recall specific and meaningful accounts of God's goodness in our own lives. We are to be reminded of God's ongoing tenderness toward us. We who really are weak and needy in many ways and remind us that God's goodness, just like God's creation, is universal in its reach. It's not exclusive to one group of people or another. We are then called to invest in and proclaim the ongoing praise of our God, the King, whose selfless giving is manifest daily in each blessing of creation. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you for joining me again today as we continue this journey of reflecting upon the lessons for the upcoming Sunday. This, the ninth Sunday after the Pentecost, August the 2nd, 2020. Have a great day and God bless.